All right. Um, welcome everyone to today's health talks. Um, my name is Rashad. I'm representing Terco Health Hub. Terco is a startup hub focusing on health and life sciences. Um, in Helsinki, May Lahti, we're uh, supported by University of Helsinki Faculty of Medicine, High Life, and Bush Hospital. So we provide various services, co-working space, and uh, support for startups. We have close to 60 startup members in our building. And, um, and I'm very happy to be here today with one of our Health Talks partners. Uh, Health Talks is an alliance of um, roughly 11, yeah, 11 uh, organizations, most, mostly uh, other health hubs, uh, a couple of universities and city representations who have gotten together to organize events on health, life science, and entrepreneurship. Um, it is something fairly unique because uh, I don't think any such alliances exist in Finland among uh, public uh, agents. Um, I'm very happy to be here with Johan, Johan uh, Anna, and Alexander from High Life. So I'll give the screen to, to them to continue. Thank you. Uh, you are on mute, for example. Thanks a lot. Yes. <laughs> Morning, everyone. My name is Alexandra, and I work for High Life, which is the Helsinki Institute of Life Science, uh, a part of the University of Helsinki. Um, let me tell you a little bit about today's program, and um, then we'll start right away. So, first of all, as has been already done is intro by Terco Health Hub, um, by me, the University of Helsinki and High Life El and Aalto University. We'll see if Markus from Aalto can join us. Um, so right now he's having some tech problems, but I'm hoping that he can resolve them very, very quickly. Um, then we are going to welcome Anna Ptucha from the University of Helsinki, given her perspective and her talk on commercialization of PhD in life sciences. And then Johan Le Bourlois from Aalto University will step in and uh, give his talk on his PhD and how his commercialization has been going so far. Um, after each talk, we'll allow for the Q&A with the speakers. And then together with the closing words, we'll have a possibility to ask more questions to um, both of the speakers or any of the organizers, if you have any. I'll also give a little bit of an introduction uh, on what is currently going on in High Life, if you're interested in this kind of events. And um, then I will be closing the, the event. So a couple of words about High Life. High Life is a part of the University of Helsinki. And it's a life science area joint effort established six years ago um, that has um, united most of the life science faculties, as you can see on the slide below. It has three divisions, the Uni Institute of Biotechnology, uh, FIM, Finnish Institute of Molecular Medicine and Neuroscience Center. And the goals of High Life are to support top life science researchers at our campuses, coordinate research infrastructures, promote innovation, this is what Health Talk is doing, and brand University of Helsinki internationally. The mission of High Life is to position the university at the top level of international competitiveness in life sciences. When I'm speaking of life sciences, I include everything from uh, human biology to animal science to psychology and all related disciplines. Now, let's see if Marcos has joined us. I think, yes, Marcos, are you here? I can see you in the participants list, at least. Marcus, can you hear me? Mm -mm, no. Nope. No, you're muted, at least from the sign on your photo. Could I try to unmute you? No, I don't have this. So if you press on the microphone. OK. 
Okay, I think he is trying to rejoin. Uh, Marcus is the organizer from Alto University side, and he wanted to give a quick overview on the Alto University Health and Wellbeing program. So that's why I would really love to have him on board. Let's see if he rejoins very quickly. Rashad, I wonder if you have a possibility to... I did. He's yes. actually unmuted. Marcus, if you speak, it should be audible. Maybe he just has a microphone. No. Aha. Uh -huh. I heard someone. Is it my conscience? It could be as well me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, the Zoom era hasn't taught us anything that's... Well, Marcus, you can right. also join from your phone if you want. Yes. Yeah, well, all right, uh, yeah. you can proceed. Um, that's perfectly fine, yes. Um, I think that since this will be recorded, let me just quickly go through the slides so that maybe people can still look at it. So these are the slides that Marcus had here, some information about the health and well-being program at Alto University, global rankings of Shanghai List and Financial Times, and uh, information on the main fields but which Alto is focusing in terms of innovation. Uh, health and well-being. And you can see them on the slides as well. I think if uh, the people who will be watching it later or if any of you have any questions to Marcus, you can reach him directly or you can write him in the chat in the next five to 10 minutes and then hopefully you'll get some answers. Hello, I think you oh, can hear me now. Yes, we can. Do you want to... Uh, do you want yeah, me to sorry. Go... Uh, thanks that you told us yeah. about those things. <laughs> I had some quite persistent problems with my, my microphone settings here and uh, now I got them fixed. Uh, for a long time, there was no option to turn the mute off, but uh, now I've gotten to gotten to do that via some some quite Hi, Marcus. Uh, strange. Do you have settings. your video feed? Do you think you can turn it on? Uh, could be, could be uh, but uh, so that I don't. Uh, uh, it's just that we have five maybe, minutes before we start the official presentation. Yes, there you go. If you could just somewhat quickly go through your slides. Sure. I have only a few, so maybe I would go to the last slide because that is the most obvious, uh, most okay. important slide. <clears throat> Health and well-being is one of Alto's um, seven key research areas and has been for a long time and uh, we put quite much effort into health and well-being and uh, what I really want to focus here are those six areas that are shown here, which are our specialty areas uh, within health and well-being. And uh, those are medical devices, which is the one uh, at the top, which is called biomedical engineering on this slide, where we do many kinds of things. But the most um, important cluster that we have are, um, are imaging devices, um, mainly for brain imaging, actually. But we have other types of imaging devices, too. And we have other types of brain devices than imaging. We have uh, brain um, therapeutic devices also. But then there's neuroscience that we've studied for, I think, more than 40 years now. That's another. And then we have digital health, which is about using pretty much about using AI for quite many types of health or well-being applications, uh, developing new algorithms for that. Then there's also various technologies based on biology and, uh, and chemistry or, or one of those. Um, like we have there synthetic biology, we have materials for surgery, we have point of care, quick medical tests, and uh, we have um, pharmaceuticals development technologies and various kinds of things. Then there's still management and economics and architecture and design. And in, in management and economics, we, we have expertise in the working processes of uh, doctors and nurses when they treat patients, and also in kind of higher up organizational resources and competences of hospitals, which means um, how, how you organize um, people to work, how you staff organizations and how you organize processes 
for work in a way that's effective in terms of cost and quality also higher up uh, in the hospital or healthcare area organizations or provincial or even na national organizations. Then in health, uh, healthcare architecture and design, we have people, mostly architects, a few professors and their research groups who partly are focused on the architecture of hospitals and other healthcare um, buildings such as clinics too. And uh, that's also a cluster, although a little bit smaller than the other other clusters that are mentioned here. That's actually my, my key thing. I wanted to just um, bring forth these six clusters and uh, I'm not sure if it's if there's an idea to have questions here, maybe not because this is just an introduction or what do you think, Alexandra? Um, I think we have two minutes for one question if there's any in the audience at the moment. Something's going on in the chat. I know. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think right now no questions, but could I give your contact to uh, people and then they I, could ask you any questions? Yes. I could hear yeah. something. Somebody yeah. has a question? Yes. Okay. Hi. Um, uh, thank you for the intro. Well, actually, I'm so interested in the digital health. So what, like how how to join or, or know more about um such cluster as you called in in Alto because that's really interesting. Um, maybe it's best if you send me an email. I will give my address here uh, in the chat. And um, at the moment, we don't currently have good websites about introducing these six in particular. We are actually doing such a website, but uh, it might be best if you email me so I could tell you more personally. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, that also goes for everybody else, of course. All right. Thank you very much, Marcos, for joining us. Uh, even though you had so many problems, you still came through and you managed to give an overview. And uh, thanks a lot for co-organizing this. I know you have to run very quickly, but um, yeah. it was great to hear you and hope you can listen to it on YouTube at some point when it's uploaded. Yeah, and sorry again, I tried to come online four minutes before the meeting, but I had, you know, nine minutes of these two different problems. So sorry about that once again. Oh, I'll worries. My address no. to the chat. Yes, this would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm, uh, so it's 9.45, so let's start with the first presentation. I'll stop sharing my slides at the moment, and we will welcome Anna, who will give her talk. Hello, uh, everyone. Good morning. Could you see my slides? Yes. First slide. Good. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, my name is Anna Tuka. I'm a doctoral researcher at the University of Helsinki, and I also do master thesis at the University of Helsinki. And I'm also involved in two commercialization projects related to the University of Helsinki. So I still was quite um, surprised uh, when I was invited to give this talk because my commercialization path just starts. But at the same time, I have used several instruments that are available in Helsinki in Finland and in the University of Helsinki to commercialize one's uh, PhD. And that's probably the experience that I can share today. So my background is in physics and mathematics, but I work in neuroscience of um, vision and eye movements. But I'll tell you a bit more about uh, my own project projects later. And I'll just start with the question, what? So what is commercialization of one's PhD? And uh, the best way to answer this question is probably to give examples. So the first two examples, this Ryadar and Arivin therapeutic companies are uh, founded by people I was lucky to meet personally. And Arvin Therapeutics particularly is a Finnish company and RIDAR is a company in my field in eye tracking research. And in both cases, those were PhD projects which turned into successful and growing businesses. Or for example, Hydrogenius is a German uh, startup which was founded by a PhD researcher, uh, not employed by a university, employed by a private company, but the company founded in collaboration with three professors is now very promising growing um, mini corn at the time when I was searching for this information. And what is interesting about it is that the founder 
the researcher is also a managing director and the main shareholder of the company. But just uh, the craziest example would be probably just Google, because uh, it was not even a PhD thesis, it was a master thesis uh, by, uh, by its founders, and uh, it turned into a very successful company. So I even don't have to give a link here to explain you what I'm talking about. So commercialization would be turning research results into a successful business, but not necessarily. It could be as well NGO or a sustainable business. It might not produce profit, but it might improve someone's life. So it would be uh, commercialization once PhD says is, is producing some value out of it, different from pure advancement of uh, current state of knowledge. Oh, okay. So uh, then let's answer question why. So why uh, I personally have chosen this commercialization path and what might be other reasons? And probably the first um, the first way to answer it would be also that just because not academy. And unfortunately, that is the current state of things, that there is inflation of PhD degrees. So a PhD graduate nowadays is not exactly what it was uh, years ago, because um, now it mostly means that someone who holds a PhD degree is capable of doing research. It doesn't mean that this person has done any real invention or any real advance advancement of knowledge. And also, unfortunately, around 90% of current PhD graduates will just have to go uh, for other jobs outside academia just because there are not many uh, positions available. And also the work itself is not probably what we expect when we start PhDs because there are many duties not related to pure research. And maybe nowadays joining R&D department of a private company and working as a researcher could provide more of exactly research duties, so doing experiments and doing exactly those tasks that we expected when we joined PhDs, um, and not, let's say, writing, grant application, um, all kinds of um, administrative and um, not related to research work. But okay, those are all our answers to question why not academia? And of course, there are also answers why academia, and that is a great field to be. But um, for me personally, the first uh, reason why I would like to try commercialization of research was academic responsibility. So what comes to your mind when you think of academic responsibility? I would say um, the first thing is uh, doing excellent research, so doing high quality research and also communicating it. So publishing, presenting, but no, not exactly. So it's not enough anymore. Now um, research community should be involved also in tackling those global challenges and academic responsibility nowadays is also about providing some value to society, to civil society, different from pure advancement of knowledge, just because researchers are those people who have knowledge and deep tech and fighting any global issues nowadays means using some really cutting edge research to solve the problems. And uh, of course, there could be other reasons. And um, for example, a kind of entrepreneurial community, I really enjoyed this community because it is a bit different from pure academic world. And uh, if you meet simple minded, uh, similarly minded people, it might be just a good place for you for one to work. But uh, one other reason, and for me, it was probably um, the most unexpected one, is that actually commercializing one's PhD might be a way to realize some more uh, breakthrough, some you know, bigger projects already at the earlier stage of uh, one's career. Why? Because uh, in academia, if you submit a research proposal, most often it is evaluated based on experience of people who submit it, based on where they come from, based on their research reputation and so on. And that is just because there is no other, other measurement of quality in research. But at the same time, for commercialization projects, a research proposal might have some more objective values, some more objective measurements of the quality of the project. For example, how big is the impact? How many people could benefit from it? Or how much money could be saved? And then it means that it shifts focus from who submit the project to what it is about 
And in this way, probably even a PhD student could gather sufficient funding to do something a bit bigger, a bit crazier than just, let's say, amount of funding that one can receive for a PhD project. So um, I also mentioned here that joining commercialization that does not necessarily mean uh, leaving academia. And why? Because uh, many researchers who start commercialization projects uh, that which then turn into successful businesses, then they then leave the businesses. So they spin out from universities and new people start to manage the companies or kind of to run them and researchers go, go back to their uh, lab. So it's not necessarily that selecting a commercialization pass is a one way ticket. It, it just uh, it might be just a good experience to add to a research career. So and then the question would be how, so that is the question of today's um, workshop. And I would start with this. I would start with invention disclosure form. So that is again about academic responsibility. Um, if there is any invention, any new knowledge produced in the lab, which could turn into a business, a new tool, a new way of application, this of the of application of that knowledge, then it is researchers' responsibility to su submit invention disclosure form to respective departments of the research organization. In the University of Helsinki, that is Helsinki Innovation Services Company, and. Uh, is it really PhD researcher, a doctoral researcher responsibility to submit an invention disclosure form? Well, I think yes, because uh, sometimes PhD researcher is the one who knows results the best and the one who can think about possible applications of those results. And if uh, a PhD researcher is in the position of a contract uh, research, of course, it means that organization owns the rights on the invention. And it also means that most probably supervisors are always co-inventors. And it means that this invention disclosure form should be drafted, discussed with the supervisor and submitted to the respective offices. And um, I always kind of waited for before submitting it, but um, <clears throat> well, I, I don't have much experience. I basically submitted just one and there are two on my table waiting right now. But uh, I was always inspired by this example. So that is an invention that came from uh, CERN and that is the invention of World Wide Web, which was first submitted not as an invention disclosure exactly, but as a proposal to supervisor by Tim Berners-Lee. And uh, you can see on this original document, the response of the supervisor, which is vague, but exciting. So uh, that is also about uh, this, um, invention disclosure. So it, it does not mean that, of course, there is no product yet. There is no clear understanding of what it will be. But even if there is an idea of application of the research, it should be submitted, even if it's uh, still a bit back. Uh, Mary, do you want to join? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, I, thank you, Anna, that you brought this up. I'm, I'm Mari Björkman from Helsinki Innovation Services, which is a tech transfer office of Helsinki University. And uh, yes, uh, submitting the innovation disclosure is also important for the researcher that the sort of the ownership of the invention is clarified. So when you're going forward and forming a spin out, you have a legal document stating who owns the rights of the invention. And that, that's that's very important for you to continue. But of course, also, we help you uh, with the patenting and, and all commercialization activities and applying money for certain commercialization uh, funds if Helsinki University owns the rights of the invention. Thank you for the comment. Yeah, so answer to the question, how is discuss it with the respective department of your university or with his at the University of Helsinki uh, and submit those invention disclosure forms. And another answer to the question, how is uh, getting training and advice? And in fact, there is a lot available in Helsinki region in particular, in Finland or in uh, Helsinki University, Aalto universities and other universities of this area. So me personally, I took a number of courses in the last few years and all of them were either supported or paid by the organization that I joined. So either by, by my study programs or, for example, the, re, the most recent course that I'm doing now uh, was uh, provided by Spark Finland program. 
And uh, there, there are many. And for example, bio business course is specifically designed to PhD students at the University of Helsinki, but it's quite a brief, short course. But uh, anyway, uh, I would really recommend joining them uh, just even without having any idea about commercialization, just to get the kind of the idea of what is industrial path and commercialization path in research. Uh, Rashad, do you want to say, uh, do you, uh, your hand is raised. Yes, I do. Um, can you see me? Yeah, so I wanted to just ask quickly that you said that innovation disclosure describes who are the uh, owners, so to speak. Uh, from what I'm told, once you um, file for the innovation disclosure, that right for the IP is transferred to the university. Uh, no, it's not that straightforward. We start okay. to study whether who owns the rights, and that's based on the sort of funding that was used for the invention. Mm, mm. And there are certain legislation and, and guidelines for this. I can maybe come back to those later if you want. But that's true. That's true. I, I actually, if, yeah. I'm recalling if the research has been done with the university money, then it belongs to the uh, professor. If it has been done with the grant money, it belongs to the university. Uh, it depends on a grant. Okay. If it's Academy of Finland grant, then it belongs. It's seen as a collaborative research, okay. and the rights belong okay. to the university. But got it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. I'm happy that uh, my talk induces some discussion. So um, uh, about training and advice available at the University of Helsinki and in Helsinki region. So here is the list of services I personally, in some way, uh, used. Either discussed with them or. Uh, kind of get some workshop or seminars and the, it's not the full list for sure so uh, just um, all these sources here like Helsinki Sin Company or Brain Incubators or uh, kind of uh, Business Helsinki and so on you can go by uh, you can explore those links and you'll find much more information and of course just at the university itself there are just study courses which you can get credits for so um, now kind of, I would finally present uh, my own project, which inspired me and what was the reason for not only kind of realizing this academic responsibility, but also to trying to turn my own idea uh, uh, into this kind of uh, something useful for society. So the first project that I thought about for a few years, but I started to, real started to realize it only this spring is called Mind's Eye. So it is um, a diagnostics of developmental conditions based on eye tracking. And um, the idea behind is um, in a way quite simple. So during development, uh, we all uh, as children pass through developmental steps. And many of those steps are grounded on visual development. So just without developing some simple visual function, we cannot develop next more complex cognitive processing of information or some executive functions, for example. And uh, this development actually is so much uh, dependent on the previous steps then that just skipping some of them may lead to very severe consequences in the future. And there are uh, developmental conditions which are nowadays diagnosed quite late. And if this uh, later diagnosis uh, happens in adult age, it might be not that crucial compared to when it happens in the young age, when the first years of life include so many developmental steps that uh, then are the basis for the whole future life. And uh, Currently, the delay of diagnosis is around three years, particularly for autism spectrum disorder. Uh, there are other conditions, and of course, these delays are different, but I'll just give you some numbers. So uh, average age of ASD diagnosis in the United States is four years. However, the first signs, the first kind of red flags could be raised already as early as at 11 months of age. And the amount of people who are affected by this condition is enormous. It's more than 10% of population if you just take together ADHD, autism, um, sorry, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and autism spectrum disorder. So just imagine 10% of population 
actually at some point have a developmental condition that can then, then affect their whole future life. And uh, that was the reason why I thought of application of eye tracking. So my field of research specifically for these kind of conditions, just because the amount of people affected and kind of the consequences of how they are affected are so severe. So the solution that I proposed was using eye movement tracking. So basically it is shifting from the experience that you have in the left when all the diagnostics is based on assessments and several assessments by medical professionals, shifting to the experience on the right. So something what happens doctor in, without doctor, uh, when just a caregiver together with a child can go through a diagnostic procedure, which is stress-free, more comfortable, faster, cheaper, it has many benefits. But at the same time, most importantly, it's more objective and potentially can provide diagnosis not diagnosis, but let's say some uh, clues to diagnosis much earlier. And uh, eye movements uh, already were used for diagnostics of many developmental conditions and not only developmental conditions, but we also propose improvement to how they can be used. So here in blue, you see, let's say a typical tra uh, trace of a person exploring these images. And for infants, usually the only thing to study how they uh, move their eyes is to compare preferences for the image on the left or on the right of the screen. But in fact, eye movements provide so much more information. And I personally believe that in the future, it might be have a, became like a blood test for behavior because they provide information about so many conditions related to neurology, psychology, related to uh, how cognition works in the person, that uh, it's just useful to collect all this information and analyze for all possible parameters that could be found there. So the solution that we propose is earlier, more objective, it's quite fast, it's infant-friendly because it does not require any task. So diagnostics could be done not only cheaper, but much earlier. And importantly, it is doctor independent, which is now a very important problem of the healthcare system that there is not enough number of healthcare professionals. So our journey was um, very fun, very uh, fast. So it started only in the May of this year, so a few months ago, together with a colleague, Nika, uh, we joined a HealthX uh, pre incubator. So I provided expertise in research and Nika had experience in her own business. And uh, we submitted the application and we got selected and we had amazing experience and also joining the community and the education. So I would highly recommend joining Pre Incubators. This one has specifically related to health tech ideas. And at that stage, we only had an idea and idea of uh, kind of an uh, understanding of the problem and the idea of solution but the pre incubator helped us to crystallize it. And so then we joined a biotech um, program, Spark Finland, which is uh, also purely health tech oriented. And it has a lot of benefits compared to a classic incubator system, because in our case, I'm based in Finland and Nika is based in the United States. And we cannot just sit in one office, for example, but Spark Finland gives us opportunity to get all the mentoring and all the training, all the advice, even when we are on different sides of the planet. And uh, our next plans oh, is to uh, try participating in competition because startup world uh, quite often means competitions and competitions means um, pitching comp competitions. So we want to join, uh, we want to try our kind of um, skills in uh, why, why science, uh, um, competition that <laughs> deadline for applications to which is closing just in a few days and probably will then try also funding instruments from the University of Helsinki one of them is healthy or also joining a uh, will join um, health incubator Helsinki we'll see but in our case we also consider international incubators just because how kind of different we are in a way that we are not um, present in one country at the same time. But I also do another commercialization project at the same time. And this project is purely uh, completely funded by the University of Helsinki by the proof of concept grant system. And it is supervised by Juha Salmitevall from Helsinki University and Aalsborg University. 
And in this project, we also explore similar idea of development and um, vision in a way, but uh, it is quite different from the mind's eye. And um, why it is different? So we want to diagnose ADHD again, but in other age group. And we want to develop something low cost and very accessible for school age children. And when I talk about kind of um, how accessible it should be, I mean that uh, we want to do something which can work even without any device and which can be used anywhere in the world where there is no availab availability even, let's say, of a computer. So uh, we focus on the specific age group and there are many insights of what exactly, what exact function we should look in these age groups, what exact development of vision uh, should happen at that age. And it might be quite surprising for you, but uh, even during teenager age, uh, children do not have completely developed uh, vision function. So it doesn't mean that they don't have it. It means that its maturity is not as in adults. So for example, their response times to some specific stimuli are much slower. And in specific health conditions, those response times are even slower. So it can be used as a diagnostic uh, criteria for, again, raising flags and finding some symptoms, particularly of ADHD. So we want so simple too, that would similar to Ishihara test. Uh, I'm sure you once, at least once in your life, you've seen the thing. So it is something to study color deficiency. And it is just a set of images. So just something printed on paper, which can help you to not only to diagnose color deficiency, but a type of color deficiency. And um, it requires a lot of research to develop such simple tool, but it is possible. And then it has just enormous impact because it is in every health center office in the world, I believe. So uh, we explore as more advanced technical opportunities to, for a diagnostic tools, for example, using VR reality, but we really aim for a very accessible, very simple tool, for example, a set of uh, prints that can be used to study this, let's say, delays in response times in um, children that might have ADHD symptoms. So. Um, just to sum up, um, I've heard that this, uh, many PhD students registered for this uh, workshop. So my advice to PhD students is to use all the opportunities available, all the courses, all the communities, especially for courses. When you graduate, they will just become much more expensive for you. So you'll have to pay money because these kind of trainings, they are specifically prepared and they are quite um, expensive and also submit your invention disclosures don't wait don't postpone i know it uh, from my own experience that i always thought oh okay i'll wait while those results are more clear or for example i don't have time now because of course there is always this risk that um, phd is phd defense is delayed and delayed what i also experienced but at the same time uh, invention disclosure processing requires time and also if it is really a promising idea you should understand that you cannot publish it before there is some way to protect this intellectual property for your uh, institution research institution will take care of that but it means that uh, invention disclosure form should uh, be submitted before uh, a manuscript is submitted to research journals and that's why it's easier, it's better to start as early as possible and not to postpone. And of course, there is this journey of pre incubator program leading to incubators or another great program, Biodesign Finland, which is basically months of, um, <laughs> of time given to a researcher or to a developer to develop a health tech product. And uh, I kind of, I highly recommend the pre incubators if you have some time and if you have an idea uh, spend your time on that because that that is experience that would be useful even if you do not select a commercialization pass later and again about uh, available finance uh, financing tools there are at least several at the university of helsinki and they mean a bit different ip rights strategy so in my case i've been given kind of um the research that i have produced so far 
now belongs to me because I was mostly funded by grants. And in this way, not all the tools are available, but there are some other tools that I can use. But anyway, what I advise is to ex explore everything available and then select the right strategy. So thank you very much for your attention and please uh, connect with me on LinkedIn if you're interested. And here I mention again, all the organization that either funded me or provided some, so provide some support right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. I think that was really inspiring and right on point. We have uh, two minutes and one question in the chat. Uh, Rashad, do you want to take the lead in asking that? Yes, of course. Can you share with people how you find time for doing PhD and running two commercialization projects? Oh, well, I don't, I can, <laughs> can't really find enough time. It's a problem. So there was a mention that we are looking for an intern in one of the projects because I'm just not able to do the experiments myself. I don't have time for that. So it's about creating a team when it comes to startup or any kind of uh, commercialization ideas. But uh, related to PhD, I would just say that there is always this risk of postponement of PhD and also the examples that I mentioned uh, at the very beginning. So uh, I know that at least one of the persons struggled to kind of combine already running company and PhD. Mm -hmm. So just um, kind of time-wise, uh, I, I, unfortunately, I'm not a good example to advise here because I'm running out of time, really. <laughs> and you don't do commercialization yourself, the commercial activities, the, as the CC activities. Uh, well, I do look for grants and I do draft and uh, submit uh, grant proposals for mm -hmm. the Minds Eye uh, project together with Nika. So, in fact, I do uh, mm -hmm. in some way participate. So, yeah, it does take your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rashad. We have one more question and one minute. Dubravko, do you want to speak out? Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, thanks, uh, Anna, for excellent uh, introduction and, and the talk. Very, very good source of information. But my question actually goes to Mari, or combined to both of you, is about this uh, proper uh, intellectual rights. Um, so kind of first question is, um, Mari, when you, do, you said you're doing um, research on that, is it only for University of Helsinki or is it kind of uh, Finland-wide valid research? For it, all of, course, of course, we are we are University of Helsinki Tech Transfer Office, but it depends who have been a part of your project or your invention disclosure. We have a disclosure where there is Aalto University, who's some other university as a, as an inventor. But because, I mean, we support researchers from Helsinki University, basically, yeah. Okay. And is there anyone in your group to talk about this uh, or to get a little bit more information? Sure. About I, I put my email into the chat box. Just contact me, please. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I would like to know more about it. Yes, thanks. Yes, happy to help. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to the next speaker from Alta University. Johan, if you can hear us and you can share your slides. Yes. Just Hi, everyone. This. Yes, we can see them now. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me as well? Yes, very well. All right, great. So, hello, everyone. My name is Johan Le Bolu. I'm a doctoral researcher uh, at the Medical Ultrasonic Laboratory, Medusa from Alto University. And today I will present you my my project on the ultrasonic actuated medical needle from laboratory to clinical trial and in what I've learned uh, dur during that, that, that project. Sorry, so, Johan, could you speak up a little? Uh, is it too low, my, my voice? A bit, uh, slightly, oh. not much. Okay, okay, I, I will try to, to, to speak up. Uh, so let's go back to the genesis of, of the project. Uh, in a lifetime, the risk of developing a, a cancer is around 40%, which makes cancer one of the leading cause of death worldwide. And according to the World Health Organization, a good cancer treatment needs a good diagnosis. 
So when a suspected pathology is detected in a patient, the preferred technique of tissue sampling is, is usually needle biopsy due to its minimally invasiveness. So this tissue is then assessed by pathologists to define uh, the type of, of tumor and potentially uh, the treatment. So nowadays, uh, two methods are widely used. The first one, which is the fine needle aspiration biopsy, which uses a hypodermic needle coupled to, with a syringe. And by applying the pressure and moving the needle inside the targeted tissue, the doctor is capable of collecting a sample. The other technique is core needle biopsy, or CNB, which uses a larger needle with a mechanism to cut the sample from the targeted tissue. Both have advantages, such as small risk of trauma for the fine needle aspiration biopsy uh, or the sample quality for the core needle biopsy. But they also have um, drawbacks, such as big risk of trauma for the core needle biopsy due to the needle size and uh, sample quantity with the fine needle aspiration biopsy, which leads quite often to, to re-biopsy delaying the diagnosis. So we came up to the conclusion that there was a need, uh, there was an unmet need for a solution providing a good sample with a small risk of trauma. This is why we introduced the ultrasonic actuated medical needle or ultrasonic enhanced fine needle aspiration biopsy. This device would use a small needle and with the help of ultrasound will help to uh, detach the cells from the target tissue by actuating the needle tip in a, in a gentle and controlled manner. This would help to collect more sample during the biopsy without compromising uh, the sample quality. We also wanted this, the device to be small, portable, and easy to operate for the doctor. And we hoped that with those points, uh, we would be able to meet the unmet need uh, of having a device capable of providing great sample with small risk of trauma. Once the idea was set and we, uh, we got our first grant award, awarded from Business Finland, we moved on for, uh, to the development. So we really started from scratch with this, uh, with this project. Uh, as you can see from the first picture, it was a, a really handmade uh, prototype made by my supervisor, Josta Henholm, building his shed. And uh, he built himself the, the transducer and cut couple pieces of metal to connect the, the needle together. But we got we got great preliminary results and, and we decided to move on to the uh, optimization of, of the overall device. Uh, we decided to do that to have a device uh, more efficient. Uh, this would have mul multiple pros such as reducing uh, the size of the device, reducing the size of the electronics, but also if your device is more efficient, you reduce the uh, potential uh, electrical uh, power, which thus improve the safety. And out of this development, we managed to fill two different patents that have been granted to secure kind of the idea of the ultrasonic needle. And finally, we ended up with this prototype, which is not fully portable yet, uh, but meets the other requirements such as uh, or being small, offering good ergonomics for the doctor and capable of having uh, nice displacement at the needle tip, which should improvide, uh, improvise the, the biopsy. Once our prototype was uh, uh, providing satisfactory results, it was time to move on to, to the real test, to the tissue test. So we first tested the device on diverse bovine ex vivo tissue, and we got great results. But the most impactful result would come from human tissue. So we managed to team up with a group of doctors from Helsinki University Hospital specialized in the head and neck area. And with their help, we were capable to have access to our first ex vivo human tissue, which was tonsil. Tonsil was used due to their availability and due to the fact that it was a not pathological tissue, so better for reprodu reproducibility. And here are our first results too. With the ultrasonic ne needle named USEFNAB, uh, we, we were capable of collecting two to five times uh, the sample mass compared to the state-of-the-art techniques without compromising the potential diagnosis. Once we got great results in healthy tissue, it was time to, to move to tumor, uh, to tumorous tissue. First with benign tumor with pleomorphic adenomas, and then we moved to cancer tissue with the head and neck cancer. And here, once again, the ultrasonic needle overperformed the state-of-the-art methods. So 
the the next the next step was obviously to to try it out uh, uh, in vivo, like on on a clinical trial. However, before testing our device in vivo, a huge task was left, complying with the regulation and the safety. So in order to be able to to go to the clinical trial, one had to comply with the with the regulation through the risk management. And this is a huge task uh, to make your device safe. And to achieve safety, one has to create a risk management or risk assessment document, which aim to identify the different risk of your device, then you have to assess them uh, with their probability and severity. And if the risk is too high or too dangerous, one has to mitigate it. And if mitigation is done, you have to re-evaluate the, the residual risk and so on. In this project, we identify uh, around 96 different risks from all different kinds of fields, such as electrical, mechanical, electromagnetic fields, sterility, usability, and so on. So this was a, a huge, huge task that you should think, think about straight at the beginning of your project. But once we made sure that our device was safe, safe and received the approval from FEMA, FEMA is the Finnish authority for regulation of medical products, uh, it was time for the clinical trial. And so on the 1st of September 2023, we proceeded our first uh, ever ultrasonic needle biopsy on a pleomorphic adenoma. This was a huge stress for me because it was more than five years of hard work crystallizing into only 10 seconds biopsy. But the team was ready and everything went fine, no complication during the biopsy. And up to date, um, we biopsied eight patients, seven for pleomorphic adenoma and one for uh, lymphoid tissue. And the results are, are very promising. As I, as I explained earlier, we have teamed up uh, with radiologists and, and pathologists and head and neck uh, surgeon from PUS. And this uh, helped us greatly to get, first of all, a better understanding of the problem that they were facing in the operation theater and what would they like to be solved. This is extremely important because one has to be in touch with the patient. In our case, it's radiologist, the one that will use the data, and pathologist, the one that will analyze uh, the data. And since they are the one that will be using the device, they may guide you in the development process for you to propose at the end one product that is in line with the clinical needs. A uh, second very, very important aspect of, of being in touch with your user is that they might be the one eventually promoting your project to first their colleagues and later on maybe to investors because investors are very in, in, interested in you having key opinion leaders and, and, and people that are well known in their field. And, and if the, the user are in your project in early, early enough, they, they might be able to promote that later on. So here are a couple of takeaway messages. Uh, if you want to start the beautiful journey of creating a medical project and trying to, to commercialize it, what, what I've learned during, during my journey. So first of all, I think the most important one is to find a robust unmet need. Uh, because without a need, there is most probably no market and there's no outcome. The second very important point would be about the regulation and safety assessment. Uh, they are extremely important, especially in medical domain, which is very tough and for obvious reasons. So safety and regulation should be uh, thought out all along your project from beginning to end. And each solution that you will take dur during your journey should be, uh, should be taken with safety in mind to know if it won't be a problem later on. Uh, we, we learned it the hard way because we did the regulation and safety concern towards the end, just before the in vivo study. And it was a huge task and, and we had to be, uh, for my next point, flexible. So, so this is, is very important too. Um, you have to be flexible with your project because your main idea is unlikely to be the final solution uh, for your project. And, and if I can jump on, uh, uh, back, to, back to the regulation and safety, we, we had to be flexible with our project uh, because it was not meeting the safety requirements, so we had to, to change a couple of solutions. Also, being flexible will help you to, to collect uh, great, uh, great input from, from your user, as I, as I mentioned earlier. So, yeah, this is important. But last but not least, uh, 
it's be sure to be surrounded with a great team. Uh, like this is most probably the most important. Uh, be surrounded by by the great uh, by the best person that you can find. Nothing would have happened without the help of, of the ultrasonic laboratory from Alto, and especially thanks to the to, to our collaborator at Pus that uh, permitted the, this project to to go to the clinical trial. On a more personal note, I've been so glad to be part of this project. It's been such a pleasure to develop this idea from scratch, seeing it growing, deal with problematics of commercialization and, and safety, develop new ideas that, that crystallize uh, into patents. But mainly, mainly the, the most rewarding thing is that uh, you may be able to propose a product that at the end may help real person. And, and, and this is so rewarding. So. So I would like to thank everyone that contributed to, to this project. And I would also thank uh, you for listening to my talk. And so now if you have any question, I would be happy to, to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johan, for the presentation. And uh, now we have time to ask some questions. And I can see something in the chat. Um, so Melina is asking whether it could be used to collect bone tissue. Uh, so we haven't tried uh, yet bone, bone tissue. I believe uh, it might be tricky from uh, from physical per, uh, perspective. But yeah, this is not something that we investigate yet. So I cannot so much reply to that. Right? All right, thank you. If anyone has any questions, um, they can raise their hand or I can read from the chat as well. So how big is the sample size you managed to collect on average in grams? So uh, we, we, are, we are speaking about uh, milligrams and uh, if I can go back to the slide with the results, I believe they are uh, written here. So. It depends on the tissue. Some are more uh, liquid, some, some are stiffer. And obviously, since we are using aspiration, uh, the liquid might, might be collected in, in, into the needle. And, and so in average, we are like around tw 20 milligrams, but which is greater than, than the state of the art techniques, at least, at least two times, up to five times compared to the core needle biopsy. Thanks. Um, Lily, I think, is asking, how's the commercialization going? That's very general. Uh, do you want to yeah. open no, the no. question up? Or... Yeah, like that, that, okay. that's a great, great point. I, I haven't uh, gone so much to the uh, topic of, of commercialization, but that, that is true. So uh, at the beginning, we, we got this uh, grant from Business Finland, which uh, includes the commercialization in, into, the, uh, into the project. So. So we try to look for investor, but at the end of the of the uh, of the project, we didn't manage to find uh, investors to to continue forward. But luckily, there was another company based in in Canada that was doing similarly the same the, the same thing. So we decided to team up with them and to try to commercialize it uh, throughout throughout this company, which is called Swan Cytologist. And we are still looking for uh, investors, and but but we hope to to find some some soon, especially with with clinical uh, data, because that was one of the points that investor didn't want it to invest at this point because they were not sure if it would actually work uh, in a in a real case. Thank you. Um... Coming back to the questions in the chat, and feel free to interrupt me if you guys want to speak yourselves, but has your device received approval from the regulators? So, yeah, like um, it, it's not a C label or FDA. Uh, I think we, we, we went through um, through FEMA uh, with like, uh, how is it called? Uh, I think it's it's developing device throughout, uh, like research device. So. I believe the, the system is a bit easier on that, but yet you need to make sure that your device is, is, is safe and, uh, and yeah, won't harm neither the patient or the user. And, and so as, as I tried to explain during my presentation, this, this was a, a huge task and, and I would really recommend you straight at the beginning when you are searching for the unmet need, th think about safety. Uh, it will help you later on. 
And we have another question, which is very similar, but maybe in my non-experienced point of view. So are you already trying to comply with the MDR aside from the risk management aspect? Is that partly the same question, Johan? Um, um, could you explain what is the, uh, yeah, like the MDR medical uh, device regulation? Um, yeah, so like, uh, I, I'm not so sure about that. Um, I believe, yes, it's the same, or I understand it in the same way. So yeah, we had to comply with the, with the different regulation. I think the main, uh, the main one was the, uh, yeah, well, we, we had to have uh, an approval from, from FEMA. And obviously, if we want to move on to the FDA, it would be a, a different one. But so far, we are already happy with, with this one, because it's a huge task to, to comply with, with all those things. And I, I have a, a PhD also to comply. So to jump back to Anna's uh, problematic, it's it's very hard to 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 uh, to play with all the balls at, at the same time. Yeah. Um, and while nobody has a question, I maybe will follow up on that a little bit. So as you said, it's a bit hard to like uh, play with all the boxes. So how does it actually work for you? day by day and also in the long term in your PhD. So you're doing a PhD, but also doing commercialization. And there are different aspects that come with that, like uh, not having the right to uh, for applications as fast as you would want and things like that. Could you open this up a little bit? Yeah, so, well, it, it's time consuming. And uh, I think you need to be quite organized. Uh, yeah, I, I, might, I might not be the, the best example. Uh, my PhD has been delay uh, quite a bit because of all those things happening but i don't see uh, it as a as a drawback like uh, i think it's 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 actually a positive thing uh, I, I don't mind um, i i'm going twice twice a week uh, usually to the, to uh, to the surgical hospital in in host to continue this this clinical trial and it might not necessarily appear in my thesis but it's so rewarding uh, to have your 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 project growing and 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 finishing it kind of so yeah it's a it's a personal achievement so i don't really mind to put a bit more hours into it uh and uh yeah it's it's quite difficult to 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 ally uh, research and and uh, and commercialization especially when sometimes they are not going hand in hand but uh, on the other hand it's it's quite nice uh because it brings you down to earth to have the commercialization idea in mind. So it's not just doing research. Whenever you will develop something, you have to keep in mind uh, the budget and things like that. And I think it makes it more more realistic and uh, and more like a, a development project, which which I really like. Um, yes, in the chat, Teresa celebrates your link landmark achievements. So. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, does anyone have anything else, or I could follow up a little bit on the on the PhD plus commercialization side? I'm very interested in that. Like, how does it happen in the beginning? How do you get to it? So, you're not from Finland originally, so you came to Finland to do your PhD, right? And then, how did you get to know Heiki? How did your supervisor basically suggests you to take part in it and then you were thinking you know, how did that first kind of step happen yeah so actually it, 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 it's a very uh, i don't know f funny story so I, I i'm originally from france and i was doing my engineering school and we had to do internship abroad and i selected uh, finland and i did my internship back in 2016 i think for haiti's laboratory but back at university of helsinki and it was already about this ultra ultrasonic needle, uh, a different project we were trying to, to develop uh, just uh, the electronics around. And then I I came back to uh, for, for another project one year later, and, and then we came up with Heike to the idea that, hey, let's try to, to make a, a commercialization out of this ultrasonic needle. And uh, and we got the grant from, from Business Finland, and so that's how uh, we, we, we moved on. So. Yeah, th this idea has been uh, started maybe nine years ago, and uh, I've popped up halfway uh, to, to this project, and and then we got we got the grant, so we could fu fully focus and, and develop it uh, forward. So yeah. 
Uh, what are your current plans on continuing this? So if you have a, an R to be funding at the moment, are you planning to spin out at some point further yes. down the line? So there, there is like multiple uh, opportunities uh, that that are uh, opening with, with this device. Uh, so we are trying to, to continue in vivo uh, our cl clinical trials. So we, we might start some uh, around Finland, but we would hope to to start some in, in, in different uh, region worldwide. And because it, it would be very important to have uh, different places in the world that would test our device, but also different tissue types, because here we are focusing mainly on the head and neck areas. And then I believe with the ultrasonic medical needle, there is uh, so many new opportunities um, because, well, the, this ultrasound at the needle tip uh, helps the needle, for example, to glide through, through tissue and potentially could create a painless needle. And so there is like so many areas to investigate. So uh, we will see after after the PhD. I, I still have time to, to think what, what are the next steps. But, but uh, it, it could also be uh, a development uh, a task if we manage to get uh, funding from, from, the, uh, from the Canadian company side. Yeah, we'll see. Thanks a lot. And I, I think maybe one question that also somehow relates to what Anna was talking about. Um, uh, so at the beginning of the journey, it's very important that there are a lot of services that is provided by their environment around you to help you out in this. Uh, did you use any particular ALTA University innovation services or anything there or any courses in ALTA that would help you in this project? Yeah, so it, it hard it's hard for me to <laughs> to remember. It was a couple of years ago already, but yeah, like uh, Anna mentioned, already business Finland, and I think it's a it's a great tool uh, because you have this business side, and and I was helped with Bjorni Rantanen, that was uh, uh, the the business guy in this project, where I could mainly focus on the research. So that was great, and and then we were part of uh, Spark Finland, which really helped uh, to to define the need and uh, and to define what were the goals and also to be in touch with with important people and and, and, and this is this is the mess, the the main takeaway i think uh, try, try to find important people that that could help you and uh, in your project yeah thank you does anybody else have any questions to johan or to Anna as well, since we are approaching the end of the event. I guess I have a question to kind of both of you um, after your talks. Now, wondering that you were at, at one side, you are researchers, and then on the other side, you're kind of commercialization specialists, right? So as you're going along in this journey, what appeals to you most? And what do you think, what kind of path would you potentially want to take after you've done your PhD? Maybe we could start with Anna now. <clears throat> well, uh, I like, uh, yeah, I liked, um... Johan's explanation that it's it's you feel it as a personal experience as a personal achievement if you see that anything what you created out of your research is applied then and helps someone. So I I don't have that experience yet. So I don't have any person who was kind of early diagnosed because of uh, my research. But uh, I I think that might be the the kind of the experience I want to get something what uh, gives you. Kind of motivation to uh, to continue this journey and uh i really uh that's something that i guess many people in research they miss seeing the results uh somehow applied so i would uh, suggest that i i think i'll prefer a more uh, applied uh, job in the future to see those results uh, somehow useful thank you and johan yeah, uh, it's it's a it's a tough question because uh, bo both of the sides are are, are very interesting. Uh, I think uh, I think I would I would reply a bit of both. Uh, commercialization is is important because uh, 
uh, as Anna was saying, uh, we are like young researchers, so we have to be the one doing the heavy lifting to bring this, uh, this new technology to, to the market. But then, uh, I don't know, it depends. I think I would choose the one where I might have the most impactful thing. So as I was mentioning with the ultrasonic device, there might be some other fun application and, and, and maybe uh, groundbreaking application. So if, uh, if the impact is, is greater there, maybe uh, I would try to uh, delegate the, the commercialization to someone else and, and move back to the research. <laughs> Yes, that's a good point. And that's often also what I hear when I talk to people who are involved in both. Um, and we have two minutes more until I give like the closing remarks. But I wonder now, if, is there anything in the services that is not available to you yet, but you would really love it and like it for uh, advancement of your projects? Is there something that the universities or the environment around you or even like Finnish ecosystem does not suggest just yet, but this would really benefit and you would really like this service to be here. Anyone can start who is, who has thoughts about it. <laughs> yeah, like um, I, I don't, I don't have anything. Uh, maybe I, I don't know all the services, so that 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 could be one. But uh, yeah, one course about regulation and, 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 and safety assessment could have helped me throughout my, my journey. So so we, we had to hire a, a company back in in the beginning of the, of the project that which was called I think Lean Entry that helped us throughout the, the regulation and safety assessment. But but as said I, I don't know maybe there is some courses that I, I couldn't pick up that that would explain those 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 kind of things. Uh, Johan said about uh, hiring companies for some help with uh, kind of uh, market research or uh, some evaluations or legal advice. So I've noted that usually uh, information about those companies is shared privately in some, for example, after workshops or during workshops. So probably having um, a resource where you can see who are uh, what companies are available and what companies had successful experience with uh, startups um, related to universities. However, it might be that this information is, is not shared for on purpose. I don't know, uh, but it would be useful to have uh, kind of trusted companies, uh, kind of a list of them somewhere. Thanks. These are very useful comments, and I think uh, we'll take them into account because it's also always nice to hear personal feedback as to how the services can improve as well. And uh, thanks a lot for giving the talks. Let me give just some very quick final notes on um, the event today. I will share my screen in a second. Um, so if you've liked something that has happened today, um, there is support and events that are available, at least from the High Life, the University of Helsinki site. So if you belong to the University of Helsinki, we monthly publish life science innovation events, but not only events, but also funding calls, pitching competitions, and other kind of endeavors that you can engage in during the upcoming months. And the um, upcoming October 2023 is coming next Tuesday. So you can find it in Flamma, which is the University of Helsinki intranet. Um, as mentioned already by Anna, just a quick update on the health innovation pipe pipeline at the University of Helsinki. If you think you have an invention and uh, you've talked already to your PI about that, you can contact his, Mari has put her uh, email in the chat, but also they have a general email, so you can contact them and ask how to proceed, and then probably you would go to invention disclosure at some point. Alongside that, you can participate in our innovation pipeline, which includes a pre-incubator Health X. The next call will be in spring 2024. Um, Spark Finland, which both Johan and Anna have taken or are taking part in. Um, they have two calls per year. And then when your 
startup or spin out is a bit more advanced, you can take part in Health Incubator Helsinki that I have in call next spring as well. The closest upcoming call is to Spark Finland, which will open on the 1st of November. And uh, you can read more on their website, but I think that Anna and Johan couldn't have recommended the Spark Finland enough. I also want to note two events that are happening very soon. So tomorrow we have a Buy Finland pitching competition. We've already chosen the speakers that were bachelor's, master's students of the University of Helsinki. And you can come visit uh, Nasdaq Helsinki in the city center and listen to the pitches and then network with the jurors and the organizers. Um, we are providing also coffee, tea and light snacks. If you register, I'll send the, the slide deck and you will be able to find the link but you could also google by finland pitching competition and you will find the registration link right there on the website why science as already mentioned by anna is a slash official side event that is happening this year on november 30 and uh, it is happening in Mesukesku, so on slash venue. You don't have to have any slash tickets to attend the event. It is free and open to all. And um, if you want to register as an attendee, the registration is open already on the Y Science website. But also, if you have an idea, you're a pre-startup or a startup, you can apply to the Health and Pharma Pitching Competition by Saturday evening. The QR code is right here, but also everything is on our website. So you can just try to Google that as well. And I want to thank you on behalf of High Life. I see two messages in the chat. Let me just check them quickly. Um, yes, Marie posted about the invention disclosure in Helsinki Innovation Services. So you can save that in, uh, in your inbox. Right. Thank you very much on behalf of High Life. Uh, Russia, do you have any last words on behalf of Terco Health Hub as well? Um, <clears throat> perhaps that uh, we're going to have another event probably around end of October and then something in uh, November or December. So just um, follow our newsletter and uh, we'll keep you updated. And thank you everyone for joining. And especially thank you for our speakers. Very, um, how to say, uh, you are you guys are proper role models. Thank you for joining the event. Thank you. Thank you for organizing. Our pleasure. <laughs>